Okay, so we are back. Mm. Hopefully you're back as well. Otherwise, I'm talking to an empty room, but I'm um, sure you're not. We've got lots of people still talking and commenting in the uh, chat. Um, so I just wanted to say a few things myself, really, um, partly because I like talking, and, uh, and I hope that you will find something interesting in what I have to say. I just um, wanted, one of the key things I want to get across today is a sense of optimism. And I asked this question of Maureen Faruqi earlier, um, who said that she is very optimistic. And I think people are increasingly optimistic that we can get rid of uh, monarchies, particularly in the Commonwealth. That's going to happen. But I think we can do it here. Um, now, there's a whole bunch of reasons why. And I will briefly touch on the reasons why we want to get rid of it. And I think some of you have probably seen me say this before uh, on our videos and talks and things. But one of the things is the uh, principled argument that Clearly, it's undemocratic, and our values are about democracy and equality. And that should be it, as far as an argument for getting rid of the monarchy. But also, the institution itself falls well short of the standards we expect of institutions and uh, people in public life, whether it's secrecy, whether it's abuse of public money, whether it's um, abuse of public office to lobby for their political agendas or their self-interest and so on. And then it is bad for our constitution. And... These arguments, I think, are going to gain more and more traction because the values are becoming more important to people's lives. You know, we're, there's much more sort of value laden arguments in politics and sort of identity politics as well comes into this. And um, I think there is a significant cultural shift going on that is uh, it's going to pull people away from the monarchy. I think that people are much more aware also, and this is helped to some extent by what's going on in politics, of the standards that we ought to expect of people in public life. And without the Queen on the throne, people are going to be much more willing to speak up on those issues, to challenge people like Charles about the lobbying, the abuse of public money, uh, the secrecy. It's much easier to argue those points when it's against Charles than when it's against uh, the Queen. Uh, and the Constitution is increasingly becoming an issue. And it has been really for the last 10, 15 years, uh, become a much bigger political issue. I think it's fair to say that people on across the political spectrum, sometimes for different reasons, are unhappy with the constitution the way it is. And so there's going to be constant uh, arguments, tensions, and debates about what that should look like in the future. And the crown powers, the prerogative, all of these things, particularly with the current government, have been tested uh, to breaking point have been used when they shouldn't have been used um, and and so these arguments again are gaining traction so the the basis for saying that we need a new uh, constitution that the monarchy doesn't work i mean um our last speaker uh, andrew uh, scott was saying again that you know boris johnson has essentially proven that the the monarchy is not a backstop and it does not uh, check the power of um, our politicians. So that's really, really important. The polling this week, um, I know that a lot of people are watching you know, the BBC or ITV, Sky News, and getting very tired of it. But I would tell you that we, as far as the Jubilee is concerned, are in the majority. We did a poll, we commissioned it with YouGov a couple of weeks ago. 54% of the country said they are not interested in the Jubilee. Only 11% ticked the very interested box. 11%. Another poll conducted, uh, commissioned by someone else said 14% are going to do something to celebrate the Jubilee. And in terms of support for the monarchy, oh, we suddenly have a, uh, a person appearing for some reason. The, the coffee. There we go. That was uh, <laughs> one of our next speakers. Yeah. Um, we... Um, I've been interrupted by Tommy Shepherd there. That was in Scotland. So what was I saying? Uh, it, 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 it was about how, how many so people, did, how did people did, celebrate. Well, also, we did, we did another poll. So I'm going to get back onto my um, original train of thought. We did another poll, which was really interesting, where we actually uh, said um, very specifically, do you want to keep the monarchy or do you want to abolish the monarchy? Didn't mention republics or elected heads of state or anything. Just asked that question. 60% 60, 60 said keep it. 27% said abolish it. Now that actually represents a sharp decline in support for the monarchy from 75% just five years ago, and a big jump up for uh, abolish um, from, again, just five years ago. So that gap is closing rapidly. Now, the key 
point that I raised on BBC Breakfast this morning is this, 27% want to abolish the monarchy, 14% want to celebrate the Jubilee. So in other words, despite all the coverage, there are twice as many people that want to abolish the monarchy than want to celebrate the Jubilee. Now, of course, there is still a majority in favor of keeping the monarchy, but that is dropped sharply whilst the queen is on the throne. And the queen is undeniably the most popular member of the royal family. So when she's no longer on the throne, which is not very far away, uh, King Charles is not going to be in a position to turn that around. He's going to lose more support. And I think that when he starts losing that support, it's probably going to drop down below 50% relatively quickly. And we're going to certainly do everything we can to make sure that that happens, but they're certainly going to help themselves doing that. But imagine the monarchy post-Queen. In the public imagination, at least, the monarchy will be reduced to King Charles, Prince William, and Prince Andrew. Because, of course, Prince Harry is still there, he's still in the headlines, but he's seen as someone who has gone to the States and is not coming back, even though he's made a brief reappearance now. And that is not a particularly interesting or appetizing prospect. I mean, they are continually trying to rehabilitate Andrew if they have been this week. It hasn't worked and they backed off and, and made up some excuse about him not being able to turn up to the uh, service at St. Paul's. But that is, that is what we're going to be having is those three men in the public consciousness, um, Charles, William and Andrew. But then looking forward, for the next hundred years, probably, if all of these men, uh, or if all of the successors live as long as the Queen, we have the elderly King Charles, who by the time he dies, we then have the elderly uh, King William, who would probably be somewhere around his late 60s, early 70s. And by the time he dies, which could be 60 years from now, we would have King George, who would be in his late 60s, if not early 70s. So, and that takes us into the 22nd century. And people say that it's mad to have a monarchy in 2022, but it's certainly mad to think that we'll still have it in 2122. Um, and I think that, that is going to focus minds as well, that these three elderly white men from the same family, same background, uh, same religion are locked in unless we get rid of the monarchy. Um, and when we look at the succession of presidents other countries can have, um, that is, not a great prospect. Now, some people, again, they think, well, yeah, it all sounds great, but, you know, is it really going to happen? The, what I say to this is that there, are, there have been huge shifts in uh, public attitudes and uh, sort of perspectives over the last 10, 15 years. And some of that is reflected in things like BLM, Me Too, much greater awareness of colonialism, slavery, and so on. But also, if you go back 22 years to the start of this century and you say, well, how long will it be before America has a black president or a woman vice president? How long before we have gay marriage? Most people would have said, well, that's probably 20, 30, 40, 50 years away. And all of those things have happened in a fairly short space of time. So when big things happen, they happen fairly quick. Certain things um, occur, certain events start to push opinion polls uh, in one direction, then a tipping point is reached, and then all of a sudden, what felt for so long like it was uh, unachievable suddenly feels inevitable. So I think that's the, the path that we're heading for. And we are going to see Commonwealth countries uh, abandon the monarchy. I think all of the um, ones in, Car in the Caribbean will be gone uh, before the end of this decade, probably in the next two or three years. Um, that's eight of the 15 that still have the Queen, so that will be reduced quite considerably. We've already heard that Australia, New Zealand and Canada will probably be following suit in the next five or six years, um, which leaves Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands, and I imagine they would um, quickly follow um, uh, when the other countries have made that move. And we're seeing, as we'll talk about in a, um, a little later, um, a sharp drop in um, support in European monarchies, particularly countries which have historically seen quite high support, such as Spain and the Netherlands. So there is a lot going on that uh, gives us cause for optimism. And also our campaign is getting a much more um, positive reaction from the public through social media, through engagement, through uh, things like the billboards that we've got up and around the country, the, uh, the print media. We've had um, media coverage in New York Times, New York Post, Washington Post, as well as interest from CNN and around the world. 
So there is a lot more uh, interest, a lot more engagement, and we have an increasingly fertile ground, um, far more than it's ever been in the past, and a growing Republican movement, because this will not happen simply because of changes in the background. Um, it will happen because we all step up and get on with the job and make it happen. So thank you very much for listening to that. And we will uh, take any questions that you have. Um, and uh, we've got a few minutes to uh, to respond to those. Good. Um, there's some there's some interesting interesting questions about about republicanism and about the the nature of this being a more, this being seen as a monarch, a monarchist country, um, and how and the fact that republicanism is not given a fair a fair sort of viewing. And I wondered as a as we've talked a bit around how does the republican argument get out in a world where the BBC refuses to cover it properly? And I just wondered if you want, might talk a bit about the challenges of facing into the media the media storm. Yeah, I mean the. The broadcasters in particular um, have um, have been absolutely atrocious. I mean, I, I wouldn't, uh, I did a press release the other day um, uh, criticizing the BBC's coverage and I, I actually called it pathetic because it is, I mean, it is absolutely appalling. Um, they did invite me on BBC Breakfast this morning and BBC News Channel tomorrow. And they did uh, one story about our billboards um, uh, on the website out of 300 plus stories on their website about the Jubilee. So yeah, it is a tough broadcast um, media environment, but the great thing is that there are, the social media environment and the print media environment is much better. So we're getting reported a lot, even if it's um, pitched negatively in papers like the Mail and the Express, as well as the Guardian and um, the Eye and so on. So there's a lot more of that going on. Um, but I think that we are going to see a change with the BBC because as the polling shifts, I think the, the BBC are going to have to face up to the fact that they are currently representing, uh, you know, 11, maybe 15 percent of the population. And this is what we, I think we're going to push quite hard on over the next few months is getting them to reassess what they did this month about the Jubilee and the way in which they um, uh, covered it. Now, I was going to... I, I, I haven't done this actually. I was, I was to say I was going to do a sh show you a few images um, because this is our Twitter feed, and this kind of brings home this very question that the, the BBC, if you listen to them, everybody's out celebrating. Now this image here is a beacon being lit um, in Strathclyde Park, and if you can see that, uh, that is the huge crowd turning out to see the beacon being lit. Um, and we can go down here and see the scenes in Perth. This is the large um, screen set up in the streets in Perth. As you can see, the, this is to televise the um, service in St. Paul's. And you can barely move, of course, for the massive crowds that have not turned up. So. You can scroll down. This is, uh, it's not just Scotland. This is Liverpool's Jubilee celebrations in full swing last night. This is, I think it was tweeted about 10.30 last night. So um, this is a pattern. There's quite a few of these around um, on the internet or going around Twitter. People saying, look, people are not celebrating. They have gone out to find where people are celebrating. There are some people, there are some events but most people are not doing it. Um, the vast majority of people are not doing it. And you probably know this yourself by going out into whatever town it is you live in, and you'll see nothing happening. Um, wherever that might be, even, you know, as someone told me, Margate, which you might think would be staunch royalist uh, territory, nothing is happening. So um, just for your own sake, <laughs> remember that you're on this, you're in a majority. Remember that the BBC and the ITV News and Sky are doing an awful job and we now have the evidence and we can go back to them and say, look, you really have to stop this. You know, and one of the things which I might suggest to them is that they do a public consultation to ask people, how do you want us to cover these things? So that they can have, give themselves some kind of cover and say, well, this is what people have said and that's how we're going to do it in the future. But they need to not uh, cover it the way they have to. Um, very interesting question here about, um, about um, patriotism. 
and about to, and about how one separates um, the sense of being patriotic and caring about caring about your country and your country thriving and being, being successful from the idea of it all being invested in in one family. Um, I just wondered if you talk a bit about patriotism and monarchism. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, patriotism has a bad name because it is wrapped up in support for state institutions, which quite often have um, gone off and fought wars under the flag. And I think that that's really unfortunate because really it should be a support of and a love of and a, um, a commitment to your community, your fellow citizens uh, and your country in a broadest sense. And it's the country, not the institutions. It makes no sense for patriotism to be about the institutions. It has to be about the people that are here. The institutions are there to serve us. And this idea that it's that patriotism is loyalty to a family is is feudal. Obviously, it is is something which comes from this time when they expected you to um, pledge allegiance to a monarch, mm. and the territory that the monarch controlled was almost incidental. It didn't matter. You know, they expect you to um, to pledge allegiance to them, no matter who you are, what your background was. So yeah, patriotism should be reclaimed as a word, really, because it is something which, um, to my mind, drives us and drives Republicans, because we do this, uh, we stick our neck out, we, we say things which not everybody wants to agree with and which some people get very upset with, because we care about our country, and because we want our country to be a better place, a more democratic place. And we do that because we want it to we want our institutions to better serve the people that live here. Um, and that's not a, um, it's not, it, it doesn't exclude the possibility of solidarity and support for people outside of this country. It's not a exclusive thing. It is a positive thing, which allows us to say, well, yes, we want the best for our country. And at the same time, we want to be part of a wider community. I think, I think the, the the, the greatest things our country, our country does come from a sense of egalitarianism, the NHS, the BBC, Tim Berners-Lee, the internet. I think it's about reclaiming an, an idea of what being patriotic and what our national story is. And fundamentally, I see the, the, I see the monarchism as being, as being fundamentally ant antithetical to that idea of what yeah, our national I mean, story is. I think it's just it's claiming a different story for it. Yeah, and I, I think this is really important. That someone has made the point that there, there is almost two Britons. There is the, the Jubilee Britain and the Olympic opening ceremony Britain, which was the, um, with the exception of the ridiculous stunt at the end, which seen where the Queen jumped out of a helicopter, which felt very much sort of levered in at the last minute and not something which Danny Boyle uh, came up with himself. Um, and I think that's right. It's the, you know, the, the best of British is where we do things for everybody. And this is why I find it so offensive when they say that the Queen somehow got us through COVID and through lockdown. Mm -hmm. The people that got us through lockdown are not just the, you know, the shop workers and the frontline workers, the NHS, of course, all those creative people that got online and created things that uh, kept people entertained and kept their spirits up, and the scientists and the people that, um, that found the vaccines and so on. You know, those that was a collective endeavor. And the idea that uh, a little old lady sitting on in front of a camera saying a few words, I mean, it was about three minutes long, uh, the most memorable of which were someone else's words from 70 years ago. I think the idea that that got us through uh, and not that um, that very democratic response that the rest of us were engaged with, I think is is daft. Um, we, there's some practical questions around how can Republic gain gain more more publicity and about the nature of actually making more making more out of the campaign. Um, yeah, this is I mean this is a, a big question. It's something which we're always always thinking about. Um, the the billboards are a part of that. It has to be. We we need to do more things which are quite visible, which are different, which are creative, which get noticed. Um, part of it is also just lobbying the media and saying, look, you know, you can't. Uh, ignore the fact that this polling is changing you can't ignore this huge body of opinion um, and part of it is also getting politicians engaged with it because when politicians engage with it then the story runs it becomes a bigger issue so people like Clive Lewis who's talked about it recently people like Lisa Nandy who's confirmed again that she would vote in a referendum to abolish the monarchy uh, this is really important that we get more of those uh, people speaking up on this issue. So these are that's a particular area which, which we want to work on because the Queen is likely to die within this parliament or next. So the politicians we have now, other politicians are going to have to step up and start talking about this. Mm -hmm. um, and so that really helps as well. 
because that um you know they are people that will always get a voice and and always get heard when even if it's by people that uh, or through media that wants to uh cause them trouble so yeah i i think that um there are lots of things we are going to be reviewing our strategy and we have our members day uh, towards the end of this year where we'll be talking more about some of the practical stuff that the republic does brilliant okay so i think we are coming towards the end of that session so thank you very much for for that and for listening to what i have to say uh, hopefully that gave you some uh sense of optimism and um because I, I, it's it's a sense of optimism that I genuinely feel more and more, and I hope that I can share that with you and, and uh, get you to think that this is something that's going to happen. Um, so, just just to add add one one thing to that, which is something you said to me before, mm -hmm. Graham, on the sense of on the sense of optimism, it is that it, this is only moving one way. There is only this is every every bit of polling suggests that it is only moving one way, and every event along the journey, whether it is the, the death of the Queen, further yep. scandals within Prince Andrew, whatever happens with Prince Charles, will only move the needle in our direction. Yep. It is a purely inevitable thing that will eventually trip, eventually yeah. happen. There is no going back. It is just just a question of when. And I think that getting people to believe that is part of the part of the movement of Republic. Yeah. Absolutely. It is a one. I mean, you know, Charles is not going to turn us around. Um, so, yeah, it is all the gains we make, we keep, and we only have to win the referendum once. So <laughs> we'll keep having them until we win. So, good. Okay. <laughs>